Well, let me tell you a little story. There was a guy that I dated one time who turned out to be a little toxic. What was interesting about this person is that one of the first things they said to me is, you know what? I'm the nicest person I've ever met. Now, at the time, I thought that was the nicest thing anybody could have said because I felt like I really needed a nice person in my life. And this person seemed to be the person. Well, it turned out this person wasn't as nice as I thought. They turned out to be a little toxic. So what it all came down to was that I learned about a new thing called virtue signaling and grandstanding. What narcissists do is they use virtue signaling and grandstanding to fool you into thinking they're decent people. What am I talking about? Well, let's begin with a couple of quick definitions. First, virtue signaling. Officially, virtue signaling can be defined as the conspicuous expression of moral values. So basically this is where the narcissist will tell stories or little tales about their own untouchable virtues and they will claim to have certain values that they totally stick to all the time. But in reality they don't have those values and in fact those might actually be the opposite of whatever values they're kind of living by at this point. But the reason that they pretend to have the values is because it makes you see them in a better light, the best light possible. Does that make sense? Now the term virtue signaling was first used by a journalist. It was used to describe any behavior that could be used to signal virtue. The original guy who used the term was named James Bartholomew and it was in an article in 2015 in The Spectator. And it was used in reference to the way that people say things or write things to indicate that they have certain virtues or that they are virtuous in general. Originally, he meant it in regard to religious piety. Grandstanding, on the other hand, has a similar definition, but it's defined as the use of morality in a discussion that is specifically intended to get the target to think a certain way about you or think a certain thing about you, to behave in a certain way as a result of it. So narcissists, they take these two behaviors, they mix them all together, and we have a really nasty cocktail. We could call it premeditated control and manipulation. They play this game really well. Straight up lying, it sounds totally sincere and it makes us fall for them. But if you really want to be honest with yourself and you really want to look closely at that situation with a magnifying glass, what you'll see is that the narcissist put his or her manipulation plan in place very early in your relationship. For example, when you hear somebody say, I'm the most honest person I know, or I'm the nicest person I know, or they might just kind of beef up their apparent integrity and their general morality. Just try to seem better than they really are. But you know what someone who actually has integrity and who actually has a good moral center or ethical compass, you know what they don't do? They don't feel the need to just convince people in general that they're better than anybody or that they have all of these ethics and morals. They just live it something to think about. Narcissists will also use this tactic to give them a sort of stronghold when they do mess up in the future. For example, you might hear a story about how the narcissist ex cheated on them and then they might say something to you like, you know what, I would never do that to you because I know how horrible it feels. And that might seem completely sincere and you totally get that, right? So you're like, okay, this person would never do this to me. And you fall for it because it's really true for you. Maybe somebody really did cheat on you in the past and it felt horrible and so you would never do that to hurt another person. But in reality, the narcissist only tells you this because at some point you may catch them cheating and then in the future when that happens they can scream in your face and say I told you I would never cheat on you why would you assume that I did this to you even if you're sitting there with photographs of said act in your hand that is how blatantly boldly outrageously a narcissist will try to manipulate you and sometimes they actually get you to believe it but in reality that's what it's about it's about if, if you catch them cheating in the future they have this to throw back in your face and how dare you ask them if you just already knew how strongly they felt about it. And by the way, they'll say, while we're talking about this, if I'm gonna be accused of cheating, I might as well go do it. You ever heard that before? Here's a really quick fact. Basic human decency should be the default for your average human, for most people. But narcissists are different. They lack this basic decency quality because they do not have empathy. They do not care how you feel, how anyone feels, really unless it directly affects them. They don't care how it affects you. Another reason narcissists do this is because it helps them sort of set the standard for your behavior in the future of your relationship. They may do this by telling you what their values are and expecting you to live up to them, by stating their own values or perceived values, or they may do this by telling stories about an ex or another person that hurt them in the past. So for example, they might say to you, you know, my ex never did the dishes, I couldn't stand it, it made me miserable, it was so horrible that this person never did the dishes. So you might decide to yourself, I want to prove to this person that people really are good, and so I'm gonna do the dishes every single time. Now this is obviously a very lighthearted example, but let's say that you do the dishes every day for five years and then one day you're sick and you can't do the dishes. And then the narcissist will say to you, 
you're just like my ex. I knew it. So even though you've attempted to show this person that in fact you are different from the ex and you're doing the dishes every day, the one day you don't do them, this person attacks you. For this particular example and any example that's similar to this, the idea is the narcissist wants to create certain sticking points with you at the beginning of the relationship or early in the relationship by using moral grandstanding and virtue signaling. So that if and when the mask falls off, they can always have something to fall back on. And if you do catch a glimpse of the real narcissist under the mask, they can attack you with these sticking points they've created. The point they're making there is, I've always told you X, so you should blindly trust whatever I say. Have you ever heard that before in your relationship? Blindly trust me? I did a lot. My narcissistic ex-husband used to do this crazy thing. Anytime we went out together and there was a pool table anywhere in the vicinity, he would try to hustle people in pool. He would literally play terribly and then get somebody to bet against him and then beat that person in pool. Well, at least until he got super drunk and then he just looked like a fool. Why would a narcissist go out of their way to appear to be not prepared or not good enough to do something and then come back around and beat everybody? Besides the fact that in this case it involved money. So here we go. There's new research about narcissism. It's from psychologist Michael Barnett and it comes out of the University of North Texas. Basically, the study suggested that people who are high in narcissism are more likely to engage in this strategy that they're calling self-handicapping. It's a presentation strategy that narcissists use, and apparently it's just a weird way that they use to get you to think they're better than they really are, that they really are awesome and amazing and fabulous. The study included 818 college students, all of whom did the NPI test ahead of time. And each student was tested based on the idea that self-handicapping, which they were calling sandbagging, is just one more way narcissists manipulate people into thinking they're amazing. I know you're shocked. Now, one thing that was pointed out by some of the researchers is that maybe this 818 college students wasn't really a wide enough sample to get an accurate reading here. But interestingly enough, it is consistent with a lot of the earlier studies that have been done in this area. Basically what it comes down to is that if narcissists do the sandbagging thing, if they do the understated thing, they end up looking a lot better than they really are and pretty much they can't fail to appear amazing. See, if they don't win, then they just go, well, I, never, I knew I wasn't gonna win, I already told you that. And if they do win, wow, we have a hero story. Apparently this concept was also tested back in 2000 at Central Michigan University and similar results were achieved at that time. Another interesting fact, this sandbagging thing is apparently used by coaches and card players. For example, if you watch any head coach talking in a press conference before a big game, they're going to kind of tamp down the fans expectations. And then if they win, they're golden. It's the same deal with narcissists. It's either the fact that they're playing mind games with their opponents, these coaches, or they're playing mind games with their fans. In either case, it's all about dampening expectations in the hope that this team can still win or can even put the other team kind of in a lull so they don't worry so much that they're going to lose. And then, of course, that coach's team has the advantage. The researchers say that narcissists do this because of their fragile egos and because they're trying to cover up their feelings of vulnerability. While not all psychologists agree that narcissists have any sort of self-esteem issues, many do say that it's kind of two sides of the same coin, narcissism and low self-esteem. The grandiosity and the perceived high self-esteem is all about covering up the vulnerability that the narcissist feels. The most recent study did confirm for both grandiose and vulnerable narcissists that basically they tend to look good by predicting bad. They use this sandbagging to basically resolve their own cognitive dissonance over the idea that they need to appear to be the best, that they want to be the best, but they're not the best, or they may not be the best. Basically, they feel like they're better than you, but they don't want you to know it or talk about it. It helps them manage their self-esteem because they're pretending that nothing's at stake and if they fail, it's no big deal. And then they give you the idea, or anyone watching, the idea that they, in fact, haven't failed because they knew they weren't going to succeed if they do happen to fail. So this is an interesting thing I found on Psychology Today. There's a little test that that was developed around this idea. Grab a pen, grab a pencil, let's do this together, shall we? Number your paper from one to 12, and for each of the following statements I'm gonna to read to you, use a six point scale. One being I completely disagree, and six being I totally agree, all right? Let's go. Number one, it's better for people to expect less of you, even if you know you can perform well. One being I absolutely disagree, and six being I absolutely agree with that statement, all right? Number two, the less others expect of me, the better I like it. Number three, if I tell others how well I can perform or of my true abilities, I will feel added pressure to perform well. Number four, the less others expect of me, the more comfortable I feel. Number five, maybe I underestimate my abilities in order just to take some pressure off. Number six, when someone has high expectations of me, it makes me uncomfortable. Number seven, I try to perform above what people expect from me. 
Number eight, it's important to me that I surpass other people's expectations all the time. Number nine, I love it when someone is surprised by my performance. Number 10, I like to see other people surprised by my abilities. Number 11, I underestimate my abilities in front of my opponents. Number 12, I understate my skills, ability, or knowledge. According to the test, number seven and eight are actually the complete opposite of sandbagging. Now, if you divide your paper into three subsections, remove your scores from seven and eight, numbers one through six are about pressure, numbers seven through 10 are about exceeding expectations, and numbers 11 and 12 are about behavior. Add up your scores and see what you get. Most people score between three and five on this scale, but the highest scores tended to be around seven to 10. Basically, what it comes down to is that most of us do engage in a certain amount of expectation management or sandbagging without even realizing it, when it comes to managing self-esteem at least. But of course, according to what this study found, people who are higher in narcissism tend to have higher scores. Here's an interesting thing for us empaths. If we do hear someone or see someone trying to sandbag or use expectation management against us or even to us or to someone else, we can understand that that person is struggling with their self-esteem in that moment, whether they're a narcissist or not. It's just a little hint that that person's trying to protect their fragile ego. You might see this a lot in covert narcissists because it's kind of a reverse strategy if you think about it. So instead of being all grandiose and full of bravado, they're going to be more likely to kind of tamp down your expectations than wow you with the results. The worst part of it is that a lot of times you might miss this one because you might not even think about the fact that someone who thinks so little of themselves could possibly be a narcissist. Turns out these are actually self-preservation tactics that some narcissists use. Be careful with the false modesty thing. I'm going to share with you a series of things that you must remember if you're going to get through this in one piece. The first thing I want you to remember as you're going through recovery from narcissistic abuse is that it wasn't your fault. You didn't know that you were getting into a toxic relationship or if this person is your parent or your boss, you really didn't have a choice in the matter. But what you can do now is now that you know better, you can do better and you can start to separate yourself mentally, emotionally and otherwise from people in your life who are toxic. The next thing I want you to remember is that you've got to try to believe in yourself. You've got to try to be strong for yourself and anyone else who depends on you in your life. Whether we're talking about your children, your friends, your family members, whatever, you need to figure out a way to stay strong so that you can keep moving forward. It's okay to take time to grieve, but when you're ready, set an end date on your grieving and start moving forward. The next thing I want you to remember is that a narcissist has an opinion that is based on their own faults. Their opinions are always sort of clouded by their own limitations. So anything that your narcissist said to you isn't necessarily true. You get to decide which things you keep and which things you let go of. If a narcissist told you something bad about yourself, you can choose to let that thing go and create a new reality for yourself. It's not anything that you did wrong or could have done better. When the narcissist compares you to other people, say their exes or other kids, if you were a kid with a narcissistic parent, if they compare you to other people like that, just remember that they're not really saying anything about you. What they're really saying is you're just someone else I have no obligation to, to please or make happy. And you know, if this person is somebody that you're romantically involved with or they're a friend or something like that, just nod your head and walk away. If that's an option for you, I know that sounds too simple, but somebody who isn't going to care about how you feel is never going to care about how you feel. I need you to remember that. When the narcissist tells you things about yourself that are horrible and they make you feel bad, you need to remember that it isn't because those things are true. It's because narcissists have limitations, like I said, and a lot of times they're projecting their own bad qualities onto you. They can't handle anything. They can't manage their own self-esteem. They can't manage their own self-confidence. They need you to do it for them. They need the supply that you give them to hold them up on a pedestal. On the plus side, if you do end a relationship with a narcissist, you won't be their emotional dumpster anymore. And that, my friend, is a beautiful thing. If your narcissist was cheating on you, it's not your fault. It has nothing to do with you. You didn't cause your narcissist to cheat. You didn't cause your narcissist to betray you. You cannot control your narcissist. And unfortunately, you can't help your narcissist heal. You have to accept the narcissist for what they are. And what they are is an unchanging, non-empathetic, attention-seeking, attention-grabbing, rude ass person. Regardless of what you were shown in the beginning, you know now the mask is off and you know who that person is and what you gotta know, what you must know, what I need you to know today is that they don't change. Not in any positive way anyway. That brings me to my next point, something I need you to know, is that anytime a narcissist appears to change, they have a motivation behind that. 
And let's say that the narcissist leaves you, with the, say it's a romantic situation, and they move on with a new person. That new person, despite what you think, is not going to get a better life than you. They're not getting a better deal. You didn't fix all the broken things in the narcissist and then send them on to, to use those things on a new person. The only thing that's different is that the situation is new and the narcissist is starting the cycle again. The cycle will be similar to or even identical to what you went through. And so if it were me, I would feel sorry for that person rather than actually being jealous of them. Remember that the urge to contact the narcissist is just almost like a habit. It's like a remnant of what you used to be. Your, your brain fires in certain ways and when you spend many, many years with a person, your brain is gonna continue to wanna know how's that person doing. So it's like if you always took a certain route home from work, and now you have to take a new route home from work. It's the same concept. So if you find yourself feeling like, oh my gosh, I wanna call the narcissist, think of a new behavior to replace that with. Maybe that's the time you take and journal, or that's the time you go for a walk, or you work out, or whatever. Just like the old route you used to take home that you kinda of did without even thinking, it's gonna take you a minute to get used to the new route. And you might have to practice it a few times before it becomes automatic. But give yourself the time to do that because I promise you it is worth the trouble try something new. And finally, no matter if you're in the relationship now or you're already out of it, do not allow the narcissist to tell you who you are. Do not allow the narcissist to have anything to do with the way that you feel and perceive your life. Don't let them have any control over the way you perceive yourself. That is really important. And on the flip side of that, remember that you can only focus on and deal with what you can control. Let me ask you a question. If it's gonna rain, should you sit around and stress and worry that it's gonna rain? Or should you just let it be? Why am I asking you such a silly question? Well, here's the thing. Rain is something you cannot control, okay? It's gonna rain or it's not. It's nothing to do with you. This is exactly how you have to see your whole world. If you sit around and you stress because it might rain, you're causing yourself physical damage, mental damage. Things are becoming a problem, emotional trauma, all these things. But if you go, well, it looks a little gray outside, it might rain, okay, and you move on, well, then you're not causing yourself all that stress and drama and trauma for something that you really have no control over. I'm looking outside, it looks like it might rain. I'm okay with it. You know what I'm saying? The point is, you can't control a narcissist, you can't control other people's thoughts and feelings, you can only deal with yourself and what actions you are capable of taking to resolve a problem. So if you have something going on and you have no control over it, you have to let it go, just like the rain. Blame it on the rain if you want to. Am I doing a Millie Vanilli thing here? Anyway, this brings me to the question of the day. The question of the day is, what would you add to my list? What other things do people really need to know about narcissists? And if you're not sure, what are you going through right now that I can help you with? Share your thoughts, share your ideas, share your experiences in the comment section below, and let's talk about it. As always, thank you so much for being a part of my day and a part of my life, and hey, thanks for letting me be a part of yours. It really does mean a lot to me. Now, before I go, make sure you take a look at the videos I'm gonna leave for you right there and right there. And while you're here, hit the subscribe button right over there so we can stay connected and continue on this healing journey together. I'll see you soon.